So let's start with the questions of the Mid-Year INI CET 2022. Now this surgery paper was again a typical INI CET paper where there were a lot of repeats from the topics. The questions weren't repeated but the topics were repeated. And again my advice to those who are preparing for the INI CET exam Right, so please note down the topics from the previous year papers. So the already last three year papers are already there on Marrow's YouTube channel. So just watch those videos at 2x and just note down the topics. And one month before the exam, please make sure that you revise those topics thoroughly because most of your questions will come from there only. Revise those topics in depth from the videos and the Q bank and focus on emergencies. That is the focus on the exam in INICT emergencies and complications, those are the two, uh, two key areas on which the surgery exam is centered around. Also the revise the previous year questions, last one month that should be your revision strategy for INICT. Let us start with trauma related questions, trauma has always been a very frequently asked um, area in the INICT exam. Now 34 year old lady was brought to the AIMS emergency following road traffic accident. She is hemodynamically stable, GCS was 3. She was intubated and sent for NCCT which was found to be normal. So there are two key hints which they have given, GCS is 3, GCS is not improving and the NCCT is normal. So one of the head injury scenarios is definitely asked in the exam whether it is EDH, SDH or diffuse axonal injury and here the keywords are hinting towards diffuse axonal injury. Now diffuse axonal injury, NCCT would be normal, the investigation of choice is MRI in these patients. And in diffuse axonal injury, it is the most severe form of primary brain injury, has worse prognosis. The key words to look out for are head injury, GCS not improving and NCCT is normal. And investigation of choice is MRI where you will see punctate hemorrhages at the grey and the white matter junction. Right, one of my favourite sports person. Michael Schumacher suffered from a diffuse axonal injury. Now extradural hemorrhage, EDH, EDH is usually seen in young patients, high velocity impact would be there, arterial in nature which is commonly because of middle meningeal artery and the key word to look out for in the question stem is lucid interval. Lucid interval you know is the period of normal consciousness between two episodes of unconsciousness and the investigation of choice would be an NCCT where you get a biconvex or a lens shaped hemorrhage which is between the skull and the dura. The most common side where we create the craniotomy to decompress this uh, EDH is the terion. This is where the craniotomy is done. Terion is the H shaped area where various cranial sutures meet. The indications for craniotomy are a more than 30 cc clot size, more than 5 millimeter midline shift or thickness of the clot more than 1.5 centimeters. Chronic subdural hematoma will be seen in elderly patients, so the keywords would be elderly patient, trivial trauma and after a few weeks there will be altered sensorium, right. This is usually due to venous bleeding and the bridging veins are implicated here and you will get a concavo convex appearance. The next question related to trauma, a patient who had grade 3 splenic injury was admitted to the ICU and managed conservatively. Which of the following signs on day 2 would indicate a need for laparotomy? Extra peritoneal bladder rupture, no you just need foleys for that. Air in gallbladder, no. Pneumoperitoneum would mean that there has been a perforation or there is peritonitis, this is the correct answer. Fall in hemoglobin of 2 is not an indication for straight away surgery. So these are the grades of splenic trauma, you need to remember the grades of splenic trauma asked frequently in the exam. Grade 1 is a laceration less than 1 centimeter or hematoma less than 10 percent surface area. Grade 2 is 1 to 3 centimeters or 10 to 50 percent surface area hematoma. Grade 3 is more than 3 centimeters or hematoma more than 50 percent. 4 is laceration to segmental or hyla vessels and 5 is a shattered spleen. Grade 1, grade 2 splenic injuries, patients are usually stable and these are managed conservatively. Conservative management I have told you multiple times does not mean you dump them on the bed and you forget about them. You need to monitor the vitals, you need to monitor the hematocrit and do serial CT scans. If the grade of injury increases, we do angioembolization. If angioembolization fails, we will do surgery. 
and surgery for grade 1, grade 2 injury would be splenic preservation or splenography. Grade 4, grade 5, these are usually unstable, we will do a fast and they will go for splenectomy. Most of the questions in the MCQs are focused around grade 3. If a grade 3 patient is stable, they are also managed conservatively like grade 1 and grade 2. But if they are unstable, they will be managed like grade 4 and grade 5. The complications following splenectomy is also a very important topic. There can be hemorrhage, there can be injury to the pancreas. Hematological changes could mean increase, transient increase in all three cell lines or you can see permanent changes in the peripheral smear that is basophilic stippling, Howell jolly bodies, reticulocytes and hypersegmented WBCs. The most common complication this has been asked is left lower lobe atelectasis or pulmonary complications. OPSI also has been asked many times, this is opportunistic post splenectomy infections which occurs because of encapsulated bacteria like pneumococcus, haemophilus and meningococcus and children are more commonly affected within the first two years of life and this can be prevented by using vaccines. The ideal time to give vaccine when an elective splenectomy is being done is two weeks before but if you are doing an emergency splenectomy on day one or day two the vaccine should be given. Again like I told you in the NEAT PG recall there was again a question regarding bladder injury. In NEAT PG they had asked urethral trauma, here they had asked bladder trauma. Both are being frequently asked in exams and you cannot afford to miss out on bladder and urethral injury. So patient comes with a pelvic fracture following blunt abdominal trauma. No blood is seen at the meatus. So as far as the question is concerned, they are saying that urethral injury is unlikely here. Catheterization, so they have done a catheterization because they had ruled out urethral injury and catheterization does not re reveal significant urine output. So that means there is a bladder injury. Now we know bladder injury can either be extraperitoneal or intraperitoneal. The radiological image is shown below and what is the next step in the management. So let us just understand about bladder trauma. It can be extraperitoneal or intraperitoneal. Extraperitoneal is more common and it can be associated with pelvic fractures. There can be a deep perineal hematoma and the management here is just Foley's or SPC for 7 days. But intraperitoneal rupture can also occur sometimes secondary to pelvic fracture because of blunt or penetrating trauma. These patients can come with signs of peritonitis or these patients can even come with syncopal attacks. Here the management is liprotomy and repair of the bladder. Now if we see here, we can see spillage of the dye into the peritoneum and what kind of investigation is this? This is MCU, micturating cystourethrogram. So you put in a small catheter, you put in the dye and then you ask the patient to micturate. When the patient micturates or tries to micturate, then there will be spillage. There will be a cystogram which we are doing and there will be spillage into the peritoneal cavity. I told you if there is a spillage into the peritoneal cavity, we have to carry out a liprotomy with repair of the bladder in two layers. This is an RGU, I had told you in the NEAT PG recall as well, you should know how to identify the normal parts of the male urethra on RGU. This is the prostatic urethra, this is your prostatic urethra, then you have the membranous urethra, the curve is the bulbar and the longest portion is the penile urethra. This is what you can see in urethral trauma, I have already covered in the NEAT PG recall and this is a urethral stricture which you can see. The next question is that after a fall from the building, a patient suffers from an injury to the chest and the abdomen. In which of the following further investigations are required before inserting a chest tube? And they had given four x-rays. I am going to show you the detailed x-rays now. In which of the following further investigations you would need to do before putting in a chest tube? So the first x-ray is this one, right? Here you can see, here you can see bowel loops. You can see bowel loops in the thoracic cavity. So why have bowel loops come into the thoracic cavity? Because this is a traumatic diaphragmatic injury. There is a traumatic diaphragmatic injury. And in traumatic diaphragmatic injury, bowel loops can come into the thoracic cavity. And what is going to happen here is that if you by mistake put in a chest tube, that will cause fecal contamination because the bowel will get injured. So in this patient, we need further workup before we put in a chest tube. This is a patient where you can see the lung is collapsed 
and you can see pneumothorax here right you can see pneumothorax here and here we just have to carry out needle thoracocentesis followed by chest tube insertion. So, here no further investigations are required. This was a patient with hemothorax right this was a patient with hemothorax or effusion of any kind because on x-ray I cannot say if it is hemothorax, but because it is because of trauma most likely it is hemothorax you do not need any further investigations to put in a chest tube here. And there was another x-ray of a flail chest where there were multiple rib fractures. So, even in flail chest we can put in a chest tube without further investigations. A 50 year old alcoholic patient comes with a history of waxing and waning of jaundice. So, we are now moving on to the GIT questions for the past 2 months. His CT examination reveals dilatation of the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct what is the most probable diagnosis. So, this is a very typical history waxing and waning of jaundice this is ampullary variety of periampullary cancer and let me just explain this to you. So, am periampullary cancers are a group of 4 cancers which lie close to the ampullary opening right or the ampulla of water. The most common is carcinoma head of pancreas then you have ampullary variety of periampullary cancer you have duodenal adenocarcinoma and you have cholangiocarcinoma of the distal CBD. Now, all four cancers have been clubbed together because all of them present with progressive jaundice with a palpable gallbladder and that is your Kuversier's law right. Kuversier's law you know that because of these cancers the CBD will be distended the gallbladder will also be distended and there will be progressive jaundice. But the problem here is that in the ampullary variety of periampullary cancers this growth sloughs out after some time and whenever the growth sloughs out the passage opens up and when the passage opens up the jaundice subsides right. So, the, there is waxing and wearing of jaundice and whenever the jaundice subsides because the growth is sloughing off there is some bleeding also happening it is associated with melina right it is associated with melina. So, th these are the 4 periampullary cancers and please remember pancreatic cancer or periampullary cancer is a constant question in the INICT exam. They will either ask you about Whipple surgery, they will ask you about periampullary cancers or the genetics. So, you should definitely know about it. In fact, they asked about Whipple surgery in this exam as well. Identify the surgical procedure performed. Uh, this is Whipple surgery or pancreatic or duodenectomy and I just told you this is done for this is done for distal cholangiocarcinoma which is one of the periampullary cancers. So, Whipple surgery is pancreatic or duodenectomy and this is done for periampullary cancers which I just told you and in Whipple surgery what is done is we remove the gallbladder the distal CBD the duodenum and the head and body of the pancreas right. So, all this is removed and then the jejunum this is the jejunum the jejunum is anastomose with the pancreas with the stomach and with the common bile duct or the hepatic duct. So, 3 anastomoses are done pancreatico jejunostomy gastro jejunostomy or colidoco or hepatico jejunostomy right and the most common anastomosis which leaks is the pancreatico jejunostomy is the most common which leaks this is also been asked in the exam. There is a modification of Whipple's procedure that is known as pylorus preserving Whipple's and the advantage of pylorus preserving Whipple's is that with this the chances of dumping syndrome is reduced ok. The chances of dumping is reduced with pylorus preserving Whipple's. So, this is Whipple surgery I have just told you and the 3 anastomoses I have just explained them to you. The complications of Whipple's the most common complication I told you is leak from the pancreatic ojejunosmy there can be hemorrhage pancreatic fistula wound infection can also be there. So, which of the following investigation is not necessary in this following condition and this is a patient with achalasia where you can see bird beak appearance this is their favorite motility disorder every second year there is a question from achalasia very very important and frequently asked topic. So, in achalasia we will do barium we will get birds beak appearance ok we will get birds beak appearance endoscopy will be done manometry is of course the investigation of choice 24 hour pH monitoring is not done it is done for GERD. 
Achalasia means failure to relax. There is failure of relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is due to loss of ganglion cells in the myenteric and the orbax plexus. Primary achalasia is because of loss of ganglion cells. Secondary achalasia is due to Chagas disease or trypanosoma infection. Vigorous is rapidly progressive achalasia. Pseudoachalasia can be seen in malignancy, which is why we are doing an endoscopy to make sure there is no growth there, right? And you can sometimes confuse the barium for a cancer barium as well. Algrove syndrome or triple A syndrome is alacrimia, achalasia, and ACTH resistant adrenocortical insufficiency. The classical triad is dysphagia, regurgitation, and weight loss. Di regurgitation is the earliest feature. Dysphagia is initially more to liquids than to solids and the most common complication is aspiration pneumonitis. So, this is the bird's beak appearance which you can see. You can see the tapering like in this picture which I clicked, the gradual tapering, this is bird's beak appearance. There are three types of achalasia according to the Chicago 3.0 classification which is the classification based on high resolution manometry and out of these you should know type 3 is spastic achalasia. This term has been asked type 3 is spastic achalasia. This was asked in the NEAT exam two years back. The management these days we can either do Botox which has the highest recurrence rate, balloon dilatation or we can do Heller's myotomy which is where we cut the muscle. Another notes procedure, notes is natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery is POEM. POEM can be done for achalasia. This has been asked in the exam. This is per oral endoscopic myotomy. This is per oral endoscopic myotomy which can also be done. Meckel's diverticulum, which of the following is the most commonly encountered ectopic tissue in Meckel's? Now, we know gastric tissue is the most common because that is what bleeds and that is the cause of bleeding in a Meckel's diverticulum in a child. And pancreatic is the second most common. Pancreatic is the second most common. Gastric is most common. Pancreatic is second most common. So, this is the correct answer here. Meckel's diverticulum has also been frequently asked. It is a true diverticulum along the anti-mesenteric border. True means it has all the layers and it has independent blood supply. It is seen in 2 percent population. It is 2 inches long and it is 2 feet proximal to the ileocecal junction. The various presentations, if it is an asymptomatic Meckel's which is broad based, we leave it. Meckel's diverticulitis can mimic acute appendicitis and we need to do a diverticulectomy. If there is a perforation, there will be peritonitis and resection and anastomosis has to be done. Bleeding is the most common presentation in children. Bleeding is the most common in children. I just told you it is because of ectopic gastric mucosa. In adults, the most common presentation is obstruction and this obstruction is because of intersusception. So, Meckel's act as, acts as a lead point for intersusception. Now, one of the favorite topics which has emerged over the last 3-4 years is rectal prolapse surgery. And this has been asked multiple times in NEET PG and INICT. And you need to know all the surgeries, you need to know what the images look like because that is what they are doing in various exams. So, which of the following is not a perennial approach for the condition shown. So, this you know is rectal prolapse and which of the following is not a perennial approach is what they are asking. So, Delorme's, Thiersch and Ultimeyer's are perennial approaches, Ripstein's and Wells rectopexy are abdominal approaches. So, rectal prolapse can either be partial rectal prolapse or you can have complete rectal prolapse. Partial rectal prolapse is just mucosal prolapse and in the first episode we do digital reposition. And if there are recurrent partial rectal prolapses, then we are going to carry out Thiersch wiring in these patients. Complete rectal prolapse, you have two approaches. You have a perennial approach and you have abdominal approach. And complete prolapse is when the entire muscle also prolapses out. All the layers are prolapsing out. Now, perennial approaches are easier to perform, but they have high recurrence. Whereas, abdominal approaches are more technically demanding but the recurrence rate is low. The perennial approaches are Thiersch wiring, Delorme's repair and Altimeyer's repair. Altimeyer's is perennial rectosigmoidectomy. 
this is Thiersch wiring. In Thiersch wiring, this is a purse string suture is taken. This was asked last year in the exam. This is Delorme's repair where we just if this is the prolapse, we just take up the prolapse by taking continuous sutures. We are going to just suture the two ends together and the prolapse moves up. The prolapse is going to move up. This is Delorme's repair which is also a perennial approach. The abdominal approaches are Wells and Ripstein's rectopexy or Goldman Freikberg procedure. In rectopexy, we mobilize the rectum and we then put a mesh between the rectum and the sacrum so that the rectum does not prolapse down. So, these are the various images. Please, please remember them for the exam. Maximum malnutrition is caused by which of the following? So, you need to understand more proximal the fistula, more proximal the fistula, more will be the malnutrition and more will be the fluid and electrolyte imbalance. So, colonic and distal ileal are out. Now, it is between pancreatic and duodenal. Out of pancreatic and duodenal, duodenal fistulae are associated with maximum malnutrition and fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Okay. The gross image of gallbladder specimen is shown below. What is the diagnosis? So, a couple of years back they had shown a similar image and they had asked about a gallbladder polyp. But this year in the image there was infiltrative growth. You can see the growth here. It is involving the wall as well. So, this is gallbladder cancer. So, these gross images of gallbladder have also been um, asked quite a few times. So, you should know all the three or four images which are there. Gallbladder polyp, you can see polyp can be cholesterol polyps or they can be true polyps and they are not infiltrative. They will just be projections. They will be projecting out. Of course, you can differentiate a polyp from a stone on ultrasound as well. This is cholesterolosis. Cholesterolosis is cholesterol deposition. There is cholesterol crystal deposition in the wall of the gallbladder and this does not increase the risk of cancer. Gallbladder polyps, polyps if they are more than 1 centimeter, they can increase the risk of gallbladder cancer. Cholesterosis that is deposition of, gall of crystals in the wall does not increase the risk of gallbladder cancer. There was a question regarding inflammatory bowel disease, a very straightforward question where they had asked Crohn's disease has skip lesions. We know this is true, Crohn's has skip lesions. Childhood IBD is genetic, this is also true. Crohn's disease is mucosal and ul ulcerative colitis is transmural, this is false. It is the other way around. Crohn's is transmural, all the layers are involved and ulcerative colitis is mucosal and submucosal. Crohn's is fully curable, this is false. Because of the skip lesions, it is not fully curable. So, Crohn's there are two peaks, one is 20 to 40 and other is at 70, ulcerative colitis is between 25 to 40. Crohn's females are more commonly affected, smoking increases the risk and this is the NOT2 CARD15 gene which forms the genetic basis of Crohn's disease which is what they were trying to ask. Crohn's has skip lesions, I have told you it is transmural and in Crohn's you can get creeping fat as well in these patients. In Crohn's disease, it can mimic acute appendicitis, patients can come with diarrhea, the radiological signs are the string sign of Cantor and you can get aphthous ulcers as well. Ulcerative colitis, they typically present with bloody diarrhea and the risk of toxic megacolon is higher in ulcerative colitis. So, those are the questions regarding GIT. Now, moving on to plastic surgery, skin grafts, Humby's knife, all these questions are frequently asked in the exam. So, skin grafting you cannot afford to miss. Skin grafts and flaps. So, primary contracture is more in split thickness skin grafts. Secondary contracture is more in split thickness skin grafts. So, you need to know that primary contracture is related to the actual amount of dermis which is present more in quantity in full thickness skin grafts where entire epidermis and dermis is there. So, primary contracture is more in full thickness skin graft, this is false. Secondary contracture is inversely proportional to the dermal component, so this is true. 
primary contracture is more in full thickness this is also true secondary contracture is more in full thickness this is false so 2 and 3 are correct this is the correct answer let us read more about it so that we are prepared for the next exam as well so split thickness skin grafts and full thickness skin grafts split thickness skin graft is also known as a thiersch graft it is thinner and it has epidermis plus parts of dermis not the entire dermis it has epidermis plus parts of dermis whereas full thickness skin graft has the entire epidermis plus dermis split thickness skin graft we know we can harvest it from the thigh full thickness skin graft from the post auricular region supra or infraclavicular fossa now i have told you primary contracture is directly related to the dermal component and primary contracture means when you harvest the graft the graft shrinks and that is more with full thickness skin graft whereas secondary contracture that is when you place the graft on the recipient bed and the graft shrinks that is secondary contracture that is inversely proportional to the dermal component it is more with split thickness skin grafts full thickness skin grafts are cosmetically better and more resistant to trauma but split thickness skin grafts survive better this is a humbies knife for split thickness skin grafts asked many times this is what the picture which you get after raising a split thickness skin grafts you will see punctate bleeding points this is how the donor site heals up and you can reuse the donor site of split thickness skin graft when we raise a split thickness skin graft we carry out meshing of the graft and meshing increases the surface area and it prevents seroma formation that means it prevents accumulation of fluid beneath the graft so this is known as meshing of the skin graft this is a full thickness skin graft which i have told you you can harvest from behind the ear and it has better uh, cosmetic outcome this is a new topic which has been added i just want you to know basic points return of sensation in a graft reinnervation starts by 4 to 5th week and is completed in 1 to 2 years pain returns first and light touch and temperature appear later graft survival is by three methods you have imbibition is the first which lasts for 24 to 48 hours then inosculation 2 to 4 days and neovascularization beyond 4 days the most common cause of graft failure is collection beneath the graft or hematoma beneath the graft that is the most common cause infections can occur movement or shearing force or a poor recipient bed this is what a graft looks like if it fails ulcers are also frequently asked so which of the following is likely to be true regarding this ulcer now this ulcer is in the sole of the foot and sole of the foot ulcers are commonly trophic ulcers trophic ulcers would be seen in patients with diabetes in patients with neuropathy where they can't feel things so there is decreased posterior tibial and dorsalis pedis pulsation this is false this would be more in arterial loss of sensations over the foot is true positive trendelenburg sign trendelenburg will be seen in varicose veins that will not lead to an ulcer here we'll talk about varicose ulcers and pain on compression of calf is a sign of dvt so this is also false the correct answer is loss of sensation now venous ulcers or varicose ulcers are seen in the gator area or the area over the medial malleolus this is the typical site for venous ulcers or varicose ulcers arterial ulcers will be seen when there is shiny skin absent pulsations shiny skin absent pulsations would be there there will be muscle loss these are the signs which you will see and arterial ulcers have punched out edges they will have punched out edges trophic ulcers i have already explained to you this is another diabetic ulcer is also an example of a trophic ulcer tubercular ulcer has undermined edges tubercular ulcer has undermined edges so these ulcers and the images you should know for the exam which of the following are true regarding frostbite now one thing which i want to tell all of you is that please solve the upsc cms papers for the last 2 years 
one trend which I have seen is that whatever surgery topics are asked in the UPSC exam, invariably they will either be asked in NEET PG or in INICT. So, do not miss out on the UPSC CMS paper. This is something which routinely students do not solve. Please do solve them. I am telling you, you will thank me later because similar topics are asked in NEET PG and INICT. So, definitely last two years UPSC CMS papers you should solve. They are available on their website. If you have any doubts regarding the answers, you can always ask on the Marrowlings Facebook group or you can message me on my Instagram ID that is left handed surgeon. But please do solve them, they are very important for the exam. So, frostbite was asked in the UPSC exam this year as well. Which of the following is true? So, amputation is done in severe cases. Antibiotics and analgesics are not used, rewarming is not done, we have to clean and dry the area, right. So, we have to keep the area clean and dry, this is true, rewarming has to be done, so this is false. Antibiotics and analgesics are used in these patients, we have to uh, use them in certain patients, not in all patients. And we have to carry out amputation in severe cases, this is also true. So, the absolute true statements are 1 and 4, antibiotics and analgesics. So, antibiotics are not used in all cases, only when it is infected. So, the correct statement is 1 and 4. Frostbite is when ice crystals are formed in the tissue and they cause membrane injury and microvascular damage. Re reperfusion injury can occur in these patients. Stage 1 is hyperemia, stage 2 is large vesicles, stage 3 is hemorrhagic vesicles and stage 4 is when muscle or bone is involved. Trench foot is when there is prolonged exposure to cold and the tissue is wet and there can be microvascular damage. Gradual rewarming needs to be done in these patients. Do not rub the tissue as it is extremely painful. This is what was asked in the UPSC exam this year. Be aware of reperfusion injury, hyperkalemia and acidosis can occur in these patients and if gangrene is there, we have to carry out amputation but we wait for the line of demarcation to form. Moving on to questions from endocrine surgery, a 37 year old nulliparous lady who is on OCPs, oral contraceptive pills since the last 3 years, she comes to you, her mother has had breast and ovarian cancer, what will you advise as the next step? in this patient. So, because the mother and the sister has had breast and ovarian cancer, she is at high risk and we know there is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome which is due to BRCA mutations. Now, OCPs, low dose OCPs are not linked with breast cancer, so this is out. Prophylactic mastectomy, we do not do straight away till we have tested for BRCA gene. Annual mammograms, she would require mammograms, but she would also require MRI because she is young. So, the first thing which needs to be done is she needs to be counseled for BRCA gene and a genetic testing needs to be carried out in this patient. So, this is the latest position statement for mammography or screening. Women more than 25 should undergo formal assessment and with average risk they should start screening by 40 years. So, women with average risk annual mammogram should start at 40 years of age, but women with higher than average risk as you can see BRCA carriers or if there is prior chest wall radiation between 10 to 30, then at 25 years we should start with MRI in these patients. If they have a strong family history only, then we start at 35 years of age. But what I am trying to highlight is that strong family history you need to start early. What are the indications for BRCA testing? So, if there is a BRCA mutation in a blood relative, if there is history of ovarian or breast or peritoneal fallopian tube cancer, if there is history of ovarian and breast cancer in the same patient, if one or more relatives have been diagnosed with breast cancer less than 45, history of bilateral, history of triple negative or male breast cancer or first or second degree relative with ovarian cancer and breast cancer less than 45, then we should offer BRCA gene testing for the patient. Breast cancer patient on tamoxifen since the last 5 years, she wants to conceive, 
when should she stop tamoxifen? So we get a lot of patients. I have a lot of patients who've been on tamoxifen for many years and some of them are desirous of having a pregnancy. So firstly, you need to understand that after treatment completion, we wait for at least two years. So at least two years of tamoxifen has to be given before you stop it for the patient to become pregnant. Why do we have to stop it? Because it is teratogenic. So we have to wait for two years of tamoxifen and then only we can stop. So we usually stop it three months before and then we ask the patient to conceive. Right? We stop it three months before and then we ask the patient to conceive. All of the following release neurosecretory granules except so paraganglionoma, medullary thyroid cancer and pituitary neuroendocrine tumors. These are all neuroendocrine tumors and they secrete neurosecretory granules. Adrenocortical tumor does not. So the correct answer here is adrenocortical tumor that does not secrete neurosecretory granules. Moving to urology questions, which of the following is true about clear cell carcinoma of the kidney? So, contains glycogen and lipid? Yes, because this glycogen and lipid when you fix the slide or when you are fixing the specimen, this gets dissolved. So, that is why you get a clear cell appearance. They are mostly sporadic. This is true. It is due to deletion of chromosome 3q. This is false. It is 3p and it arises from proximal convoluted tubule and not DCT. So, the correct answer is 1 and 2. Clear cell is the most common type, deletion of 3P and 6P and this can be associated with von hippel lindau syndrome and commonly arises from the proximal convoluted tubule. Papillary renal cell cancer can be seen in hereditary papillary RCC syndrome, CMET mutation can be there, somoma bodies would be seen, PCT is more commonly affected than DCT and this can be associated with long term dialysis therapy as well. So, this is what papillary RCC would look like. Chromophobe RCC has the best prognosis. This is loss of multiple chromosomes like 1, 2, 6, 10 and 13. Commonly seen with Bert hogg dube syndrome and you get plant like cells and raisin like nucleus in these patients. This is chromophobe RCC where plant like cells and raisin like nucleus is seen. A 35 year old comes to the OPD with right flank pain. CT image is shown below which of the following statement is incorrect. Now this was a CT image where there was a hydrated cyst where there were hydrated cysts multiple hydrated cysts in the kidney. So they are asking about hydrated cysts. We have to give albendazole. It is caused by tapeworm infection. This is also true and we know that dog is the definitive host in these patients. Sheep is the intermediate host and man is the accidental intermediate host. Man is the accidental intermediate host. The most common organ affected is the liver but kidneys and lungs can also be affected. Leakage of cysts can cause anaphylaxis which is why we have to be very careful and FNAC is required before surgery this is false. Because if we do an FNAC, we can rupture the cyst and there can be anaphylaxis. So, serology and imaging can clinch the diagnosis. On imaging, you can see here and we can do serology to clinch the diagnosis as well. A patient develops loss of sensations over the root of penis following laparoscopic hernia surgery. Which of the following nerves would you implicate? So, the most commonly injured nerve during hernia surgery we know is ilioinguinal and ilioinguinal is during open surgery sometimes during laparoscopic surgery also this can be injured and this can give rise to loss of sensations over the root of penis. So, you should know this it is ilioinguinal nerve. Now, you should know the complications of open inguinal hernia surgery are hemorrhage, injury to cord structures, most common nerve injured is ilioinguinal. Most common nerve entrapped in the mesh is iliohypogastric and this can also give rise to pain. Chronic inguinal pain can be there because of entrapment of the iliohypogastric nerve. There can be recurrence and wound infection as well. 
laparoscopic surgery there are two procedures you can have tep that is total extra peritoneal repair or you can have trans abdominal preperitoneal repair the triangle of doom and pain has been asked multiple multiple times in the INICET exam you should be aware of triangle of doom and triangle of pain triangle of doom is bounded by the vas the testicular vessels and the peritoneal reflection and you have the external iliac vessels the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve in this triangle so no stapler or tacker should be placed in the triangle of doom otherwise it can give rise to bleeding the triangle of pain is lateral to it triangle of pain is bounded by the testicular vessels you have the peritoneal reflection and the iliopubic tract superiorly the most commonly injured nerve here is the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh and that can give rise to myralgia paresthetica that means there can be altered sensation and pain along the lateral part of the thigh that is myralgia paresthetica if you combine the triangle of doom and pain you get the trapezoid of disaster no stapler or tacker should be placed here one more term is corona mortis corona mortis is an abnormal communication between the obturator and the iliac vessels and this is behind the pubic tubercle if this gets injured it can also give rise to torrential hemorrhage during surgery so these were the various questions which were asked in the INICET exam I've already told you a distribution I've done them topic wise so that you can note down these topics and you can revise them before the exam one thing which you should remember whether you're preparing for the INICET exam or the NEET PG exam at least leave one and a half months for yourself for revision so you should try to finish your course in such a manner that before any exam at least you have one and a half months for revision so that you can revise because if you don't revise then it is very difficult for you to get a good rank and what to do in the revision you need to do the high yield topics the previously asked topics which I have repeatedly covered up when I was talking about these questions and these topics also if you are running short of time you can make use of the revision videos and the MCQ discussion videos where all the faculties have covered these points so rather than leaving a subject completely at least do the revision and the MCQ discussion videos and that would mean that you've at least done 60 to 70 percent of that topic right thank you very much if you have any questions you can post them in the comment section or ask me the academic queries in the marrow links Facebook group thank you